chapter 4, we're going to spend a lot of time this year to get us to the measure of the stature of Christ, to really deal with things and get us to a, a place that Jesus wants us to be, like him. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse uh, 11, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And here's 13 is where it really kind of kicks things in high gear. It says, until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So this is the purpose of the ministry gifts, the five-fold ministry gift. We call them apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. One of the main reasons why you go to church outside of fellowshipping with one another, getting edified, but one of the main reasons is that you will grow to this measure to the stature of Christ, to the fullness of what God has called us to be. I mean, because if you agree with me, we're like down here somewhere, right? We need to, God wants us here, right? Walking, talking, breathing, little Jesus is on the earth, so to speak, right? Where the Bible says, 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so are we in this world. And he says, you know, let your light shine. You're the salt of the earth. Well, I don't think we're very salty. <laughs> I don't think we, we shine bright enough. If we did, uh, there's a lot of things, I think, that we could avoid or deal with. We're supposed to deal with things on this earth. God left us here as his government. The word church in the Greek we know is ecclesia, but the church was the Greek government in Athens. That's what they called it. Back in 504 B.C., the government in Athens was called church. And the church got together and they dealt with things in Athens. So God left us here and he says, you're the church. He says, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. In other words, he says, you deal with these things. I've left you, my government, on the earth to bind things, to loose things, to lay hands on the sick, to if you take up serpents, they won't hurt you. If you drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt you to speak in new tongues, to our shadows should heal the sick like Peter. You know, these are supernatural things that we should be walking in as the government of God on the earth. Thank you for your amens. Amen. Now, granted, we're not there. We should be there. I mean, I've been a Christian since I was 24 years old. That's a lot of years. <laughs> I should be there. A lot of us should be there. I think I've wasted maybe decades on some things that I should not have wasted my time on. I don't want to spend time in church just doing routine. I want to grow to the measure and the stature of Christ. I don't want us to be just routine. When you come every, more, every Sunday, you're going to change. Now, now, we've walked into a new year, right? 2022. 2021 is gone. 2022 is here. But we can't step into a new year without dealing with things in our lives. The only way we'll be come to the stature of the fullness of Christ is if we get rid of the things that are preventing us to be like him. Right? So what is the number one thing that prevents us to be like him? Us. Our flesh. We are crucified with Christ. And until that crucifixion truly takes place in your life, you know, your old stuff will continue to walk right into 2022. How many of us just took whatever baggage we had in 2021 and walked into 2022? We did it from 2020 to 2021. We do that every year. But we can't measure, get up to the measure of the stature of Christ until we deal with the baggage in our lives. Amen? You, now, so go to Philippians chapter 3. We have to deal with this stuff. Philippians chapter 3. Listen, this, I mean, there's a lot of people that just don't like to confront their issues. They're non-confrontational. They don't want to acknowledge they have a problem, right? One of the things about an alcoholic, you always say, is first thing is to acknowledge you have a problem, right? I, I, listen, as, as people, we have to acknowledge we have a problem. 
this is why one of the things that 2 Corinthians 5 says, Paul was very adamant. He says, if you're a new creature, if you're born again, you are a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. But why is it that we keep dragging the, that old stuff into our lives? Why is all that dead stuff still with us? That keeps us from the measure of the stature of Christ. There's nothing dead in Christ. <laughs> he left it in the grave. When he was raised from the dead, that's a resurrection-powered Christ. It's a, a Christ full of life. And we need to be there, but we need to let the old die. Now look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, underline this word, forgetting uh, those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So notice what Paul, sa uh, Paul says. He says, there's no way. He says, I'm still going for the prize, right? Because he talks about me. He, look, he says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ, right? He says, I'm still going for the prize. I'm not giving up on a prize, but there's certain things that I need to forget, because if I don't, I'll never finish my course. I'll never run my race because I'm still dragging all this weight with me. Now, notice the word he uses. He uses the word forgetting. Look, forgetting those things which are behind, right? Interesting about the Greek word for forget. We always think about it as, uh, let's just forget it and not deal with it. Right? You know, if we have issues, things we grew up with. Let me give you a quick example of what I mean. So this young, there's a young man who grew up in, who was born in the 1880s in Germany. Uh, his dad used to beat him constantly. All throughout his young adult life, his dad used to beat him. He was a little smaller than everybody else. He was very non-athletic, but he was very creative. He had this gift inside of him to draw. He loved to draw. He was an artist. His dad would see him because his dad was a tough man. His dad would see him just sitting there drawing. His dad would take the draw th thing, rip it up, and beat his son. He says, no, that's not what my son's going to be. He's not going to grow up to be an artist. He says, you're going to grow up to be a tough man. His dad would beat him so bad that there were many times at night he would, his, there would be blood in his urine. His dad beat him one time so bad he was in a coma for three days in the hospital. So this just, it was a repetitive thing. His dad was such a... Uh, a nasty person but he decided as he's growing up he says I'm not going to be killed by him but I'm going to kill him one day as soon as I get old enough and smart enough and strong enough I'm going to kill my dad one day sadly for him or unfortunately for him the dad died young unexpectedly while he was a young kid but he still had that rage inside of him one of the things he found out about his dad uh, from his mom was that his dad was the product of rape. Praise the Lord. Just hit the X on the side. Or hit the mute button on the keyboard. There we go. All right. So, praise the Lord. So one of the things that he found out... Oh, I thought that was another sound of... What is that? So, so he found out that his dad was a product of rape. He was born in the mid-1800s, his dad. His mom was a servant girl in a Jewish household. The owner of the, the household, the dad of the household, raped the servant girl. And, and the moment they found out that she was pregnant, they kicked her out in the street. So now she had a baby, which was his father, had a baby in the streets and had to survive in the streets. So he grew up fighting. So the kid knew that, that now the son knew that, right? His dad was a product of a rape from a Jewish man. Well, this guy grew up to hate Jews also. This guy happened to be Adolf Hitler. And his anger was so much because he never dealt with it that he killed six million Jews. I want you to think about how evil sometimes is an event that takes place in our lives baggage that we carry that can foster up so much hate that can foster up so much flesh 
that even when we come to Christ because we know we have to, we, we, we can't deal with it ourselves, we come to Christ because we have this evil in our lives, yet now we're in Christ and that evil still lurks because we don't deal with it. We kind of just put it away and we put on a Christian face. We don't, we don't acknowledge the power of God that can fix that. Here's what Paul, and listen, we, I'm telling you, we will never get to the stature of the measure of the fullness of Christ if we don't deal with our baggage. We can't just say, well, I forgive and let's move on. We can't just say, I forget, because that doesn't work. Because it will always creep up. The Greek word here means to get over an issue, an evil issue. That's what the Greek word means here. In order to get over it, in other words, it says the Greek, if you read it, it says deal with it. You don't just get over something, you deal with it. Once it's dealt with, close the book, let's move on. In other words, if you've been raped, I'm dealing with my attacker. I, I, w you did this. Now we're done with it. I'm moving on. I forgive you, but I'm facing my attacker. In other words, you need to face your sin. Let me tell you something. When you come to Christ, you're facing your sin because he became sin for us. And until you face him, you'll never deal with what's inside of you. When you look at Christ, don't look at this wonderful, you know, great man, which you know what I'm saying, but look at the scars, look at the nails, look at the ripping in his back, look at the thorns, take focus on that. I'm like, he did, that's my sin. My sin did that. The man who sinned against me did that. Yeah, that's what it looks like. But now I'm dealing with it and I'm moving on. That's the evil. Listen, didn't the father turn his back on Jesus because he saw the evil of man on, on the cross? But God said, here's what we're going to do, son. We're going to deal with their sin. Do you realize Jesus just didn't say, okay, you're forgiven, let's move on. He said, no, I'm going to deal with your sin. How? Head on, I'm going to hell and face that guy. I'm not trying to be confrontational. I'm not asking you to go dig up the past. But if you're still dealing with the past, you need to face it. Why are you like the way you are? If Christ truly changed your life, why are you still like the old person? You got to ask yourself that. Why do I still have buttons that press? I know I have buttons. You press my button, I'm going to freak out. I know it. What do I do? I try to I deal with it. I crucify my flesh. No, that part of my life is over. You, you, New Year's resolutions are great. I made one. I'm going to lose 50 pounds. Yeah, right. <laughs> unless, I deal, unless I deal with my eating habits, I'll never lose 50 pounds. There is no pill, magic pill, like Dr. Oz says. If you eat, drink this pill, you'll lose 10 pounds. <laughs> there is no magic way to lose weight. I got to deal with my my appetite it's the same thing with the baggage in our lives you know think about uh, there's this guy named Johnny Johnny was a kid in a, in a great neighborhood like say like Noah Connecticut and uh, a young girl and, a and a, her brother move in next door Johnny looks at the girl she looks sweet you know she's sweet on him she invites him over Johnny comes over and guess what the brother rapes Johnny she set him up. So now Johnny is, only girls get raped by boys. Johnny now is a little older, he's on a football team, and Johnny destroys people. Johnny's the best linebacker they have. I mean, he just doesn't tackle you, he destroys you. Johnny now is the strongest kid in the football team, lifts more weights than anybody, has more girlfriends than anybody, is the most dapperest, guapo, nicest guy-looking guy on the team. 
Why? Because he's still dealing with, I'm not a girl. Only girls get raped by a guy. Johnny becomes, he starts his own company, an entrepreneur. Johnny is now the CEO of this multi-million dollar company. Johnny gets married, has two kids, has the most beautiful wife in the world, a trophy wife, has a perfect life. But now Johnny's fooling around with his secretary. Johnny's fooling around with his vice president. Johnny's having affairs. His wife catches him. The board of directors find out he's sleeping around with all the vice presidents, the women. They fire him. Johnny goes to counseling. I don't know what's wrong with me. I just have this, you know, I'm just a strong man. I'm a man. No, Johnny, what's going on inside of you? Finally, Johnny comes to Christ, and the pastor says, Johnny, there's something else going on, and you need to deal with it. Johnny breaks down and cries and yells in the middle of church, I'm not a girl. Johnny's now 40-something years old, successful, good-looking guy, but guess what? As a kid, he thought he was a girl because something was done with him, to him. How many of us, something happened to us as kids? How many of us can't have a relationship? Go from guy to guy to guy to guy, girl to girl to girl to girl. How many of us can't come to Christ fully because we don't want to lay aside our baggage? Go to John 18. Now, I'm going to share something which, well, actually, excuse me, go to Mark, Mark, go to Mark, go to Mark chapter 2, sorry, Mark chapter 2, God bless you, in Jesus' name, Mark chapter 2, everybody with me, everybody online, good, you didn't leave, did you? Praise the Lord. Your new life begins at the altar, but your altered life begins after that. You want a truly altered, be a Christian life? Yeah, time to start dealing with stuff, and let's make, let's make some changes. Let's be different this year. Let's stop, the, let's stop being manipulated by the devil in our, our past. Yeah, it happened to you. Johnny was raped. It happened. And Johnny, you're not a girl. Until Johnny came to the acknowledgement, no, I didn't let that happen to me. But it's not my identity. My identity is in Christ. Are you, what did I say, Mark chapter 4? 2, Mark chapter 2. Praise the Lord. Mark chapter 2. Remember the guy who was... Uh, paralytic verse 1 mark chapter 2 verse 1 and again he entered capernaum after some days and it was heard that he was in the house immediately many, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them not even near the door and he preached the word to them then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men great to have four friends right four crazy faith friends Verse 4, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on, the, uh, on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you. Let me stop right there. Let's talk about the paralytic for about a minute, okay? So what is a paralytic? A paralytic is somebody who can't move. A paralytic is stuck in his bed. He can't get to Jesus. If you're paralyzed, you can't get out of your house. You are totally dependent on somebody else, right? If you're paralyzed, you're probably living alone. Do you hear me? You have no friends, probably. You, you, you're, just, you're by yourself, alone in the dark. Woe is me, I'm paralyzed. But one day, these four guys, four of his friends, picked him up. Notice this. 
they took him outside in the public eye and put him right in the middle of where Jesus was. They totally exposed him. He's not hiding in this house. He said, hey, can you guys get Jesus to come here? You know, I don't want people to see me in this condition. He is now totally exposed in the middle of where Jesus is. I want you to notice what Jesus said. He saw their faith. He didn't say their faith healed him. He didn't say that. His, their faith didn't heal him. He says he saw their faith. What? Only Jesus can help. Notice how Jesus fixes the issue. Notice how he fixes the issue. Your sins are forgiven you. In other words, there is something inside of you, son, that has caused you to be physically sick. If you're ever asking why, why is this always happening to me? Why am I always sick? Or why is this? Well, maybe there's something inside of you that is causing the outside to be affected by it. Maybe there's baggage inside of you that's causing outside things. Well, guess what? Keep your heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. I talked about that last week. Guard your heart. Keep your heart. Jesus said, you're forgiven. Now get up and walk. He says, because it's your sin. It's the baggage that you have that caused this sickness. 2022, if you're carrying, if you carried baggage past the midnight, if you carried sickness past midnight, I'm not saying, you know, the, the flu or the virus or a cold. I'm talking about other deep issues that you've had for years. Well, you need to know that your sins have been forgiven. Jesus forgave you. Plead the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for the blood. I face my sin. Be exposed. It's okay to expose yourself. If Craig was here, he would say, be naked. Craig likes to be naked. I'm no, just kidding. It's a marriage group thing. <laughs> be naked in front of your spouse. In other words, be exposed. People come to Jesus, right? And they just, they just, no, don't go there. Nope. Don't tell the pastor about my sin, Lord. Don't let it come out in public. No, if God's got to get you right in the middle of the floor in front of every camera there is in the world to expose you, rather God would rather expose you and shame you than your sin take you to hell. It's better to be shamed than go to hell. Right? No, I'll keep that. That's my sin. God knows what I'm dealing with. We th always throw excuses. You know, God knows my heart. He knows what happened. God's like, no, I came to set you free. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to mend the brokenhearted, to set at liberty the captives. He said, no, no, I didn't make you to carry that hurt, Colbert, No. I created you to be free. Stop it. Get over it. Face it. Get exposed before Jesus and let him heal your heart and mend you back together again. All right. Go to John chapter 18. Everybody good so far? I like, you know, when uh, uh, Patty was here, she talked about Peter. I like Peter because he's a knucklehead. You know, he always opens his mouth and says something. He sticks his foot in it, right? But let's look at how, remember, uh, we, we admired Peter. He, when he was filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, he got up and preached the greatest message ever, ever recorded in the Bible. 3,000 people got saved after that. He walked on water. His shadow healed people. I mean, chains were broken. He walks out of prisons. 
I mean, come on, the man was amazing. But he was a total screw-up before that. He was a total failure. And he committed one of the ultimate betrayals to Jesus before Je while Jesus was going to the, through the courts. We say Judas gave the Judas kiss, right? He betrayed Jesus. But Peter, Peter denied him three times right in front of him, his best friend. And how Jesus healed his heart is amazing. Peter became totally, ex Jesus exposed him, but he never condemned him. He healed his heart. But actually, he let Peter heal his own heart. John 18. Everybody there? Let's take a look. John 18. Verse, everybody good? Okay. John 18, verse, uh, let's see, where is it? I have it written down. It's uh, verse 15. Ready? Uh, huh? Oh, I'm in Acts. Oops, that's why it doesn't look right. Okay. John 18, verse, I knew it, it I, anyway. Um, he says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. So notice they're following Jesus. They're seeing him in shackles and chains and being brought to the high priest. He says, but Peter stood at the door outside. So he's outside watching him. Then the other disciple who was known to, be the high priest, who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her and who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door that said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, not me, nah. Can I ask you a question? She's a servant girl, and I'm not putting her down. Why do you have to lie? What is she going to do to you? Why lie? You wonder why somebody outright lies to you. Like, come on, you don't have to lie. That was stupid to lie. This is dumb. Did you go to Popeye's yesterday, John? No, I didn't, you know. John likes Popeye's. We're trying to get him. He's addicted to Popeye's now because it's across the street from where he lives. No, not me, brother. I only go on Tuesdays. That's what he tells us. I only go on Tuesdays. It's like, John... John, don't, don't lie. We saw your car in the drive-thru. We know you were at Popeye's. We know you get nuggets and stuff. Come on, John. Come on. Come on. He loves the biscuits. Red beans and rice. Come on. Did you have the spice one or the non-spicy one? And John, John's like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. Yeah, you had the spicy one. <laughs> he had the spice. He had spice. Why is Peter lying? This is the guy who can save him. Baggage. It's baggage. How many, how many of you, you, don't, you, you do these stupid things and like, I, I don't like doing that. I don't know why I keep doing it. I thought I had it. Even Paul said in Romans, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do, I don't want to do, I did do and do do and do these do's and I don't. He says, but I did it. <laughs> right? It's like, come on, stop. When am I going to break this cycle? Why did he have to lie? Verse 18. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire underlined this. They made a fire of coals and stood there, underlined that. Fires of coal, a fire of coals and stood there. For it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus, so he's watching everything. He's right there. Drop down to verse 22. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm. <clears throat> Go down to verse 24. Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, Hey, you are not the one of the disciples, are you? He denied it again. 
and said, no, not me, I, not me, nope, nope, not me, must, guy must look just like me. You know what they say, there's always a twin in the world. <laughs> not me. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, didn't I not see you in the garden with him? You look just like him. Peter then denied it again, and immediately the rooster crowed three times. The ultimate betrayal, the man who saved your hiney of, uh, just a few minutes ago by healing uh, the, guy, the Roman soldier's ear, who you cut off, you could have been to jail, but he got rid of the evidence for you. Here's the man who got rid of the evidence. When you come to Christ, he gets rid of the evidence against you. He forgives you of all your past. He washes away all your sin. Everything is white as snow. You're a new creature in Christ. Jesus got rid of the evidence. He sliced the guy's ears off and he goes, I don't see no ear broke. God, did you? I didn't see anybody. I saw him. No, no, you didn't. Show me the evidence. There's no evidence that you ever sinned. Because the blood washed it all away. There's nothing recorded in heaven that you ever sinned when you came to Christ. The only thing that written there is your name. In the Lamb's book of life. He got rid of Peter's evidence. Yet Peter denied him three times. Let's go to John chapter 21. Let's finish this up. Let's see how Jesus dealt with it. How Jesus exposed Peter. John chapter 21. <clears throat> Verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. In this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel, then and so on, uh, and two other, others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Let me just kind of give you what's going on up to this point, because I, I missed a couple of details that I just want to throw in so we don't have to read. Jesus rose from the dead. It's now eight days later. Let me ask you something. Who was at the cross when he was crucified? It wasn't Peter. Peter wasn't there. Why? He was full of shame. He ran from Christ. John was there. The ladies were there. Mom, Magdalene, a few other ladies, right? Peter wasn't there. Why? He was ashamed of himself. I can't believe I did that. I just, I can't believe I keep falling to that same sin. I can't believe I denied the master. He loved me. He erased all the evidence. Eight days, eight days later from the incident. This is eight days later. Peter now, listen, Peter now, eight days he's been thinking about what he did to Jesus. And what does he do? What is Peter? He's a fisherman. What does he do? He goes back to his old life. I, I, I don't know how to deal with this sin, so I'm just going to do what I always did. I'm going fishing. Yeah. I'm just going to go fishing. Because you can't deal with it. You ever notice when people can't deal with stuff, what do you do? You go back to the old, wait, you go back to the old life again. Instead of pressing forward, forgetting those things that are behind, Pressing forward for the prize. Deal with it. No, what does he do? I'm going back to my old ways again. I'm just going to be a fisherman. That's all he knew. Old ways. Watch this. Verse 3, Peter said, I'm going fishing. They said, I guess we're going to go with you. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, notice how everything just crashes. He's a fisherman. He should be catching fish. But if you go back to your old life, everything's going to crash. Nothing's going to work for you. 
They went out and immediately got into the boat, but when nothing, they caught nothing, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast net, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of the fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it, that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. You don't put on a jacket to jump in the sea. You take clothes off to jump in the sea. He's totally messed up. He doesn't know how to deal with it. It's Jesus. Listen, Jesus came to him and spoke his language. Watch this. He acted like a, oh, uh, you're a fisher, fisherman? I know a real spot. It's called the hub, right, Frank? I know, I know the spot. Just throw your net over there. <laughs> he spoke his language. Watch this. But the other disciple came in the little boat. They were not far from the land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. There was so much abundance of fish. Watch this. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there. Do you remember what I said before about the fire of coals? Do you know that nowhere else in the entire Bible is this term, fire of coals, written except these two instances. When Peter betrayed him, and Jesus is setting him up. He's saying, you know what, Peter? You had an opportunity to repent. I'm coming to you, and I'm going to expose you. What does he do? Same scenery. Fire of coals. Peter looked at the fire of coals and probably said, you ever notice how something, it, it jogs your memory of a past hurt, a past sin, a smell, uh, 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 whatever, a smell, a look, a a voice, a trigger. Jesus sets up the trigger. A fire of coals. That's where you denied me. That's where you're going to be healed. Watch this. Hold on. Let's, let, me, let, me, let me continue. Verse 9. So as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals and fish laid on and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you caught. Watch the next verse. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of one large fish, 153. You got to understand why God puts these things in there. Watch this. Although there were so many, the, not, the net was not broken. Peter identifies at a, as a fisherman, the net is not broken. Jesus is saying, Peter, you're not broken. He identifies as a fisherman, and a net should be broken. Peter probably thought for the last eight days, I'm a broken man. I denied Christ. I'm no good. I'm garbage. Jesus says, you're not broken, Peter. Look at the net. If you're hurting this morning, I just want to tell you, you're not broken. You're not broken. You're not a hot mess. All you need to do is get, deal with it and get over it. He mends everything back together. That's his specialty. Look at this. Let's see how he did it. Ready? Let's see how he did it. So here's the scenery. We're almost done. Here's the scene. I'm Jesus. Hot coals. Fire of hot coals. Peter's dragging the net that's not broken. He comes and sits at Jesus right to warm himself. He's by the fire. And Jesus said to him, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. And Jesus then came to the bread and gave it to them, likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Ready, ready? So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? 
Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He didn't say, Peter, you denied me. I got an issue with you. He didn't bury Peter. Do you know what I'm saying? He didn't nail Peter. I've got a bone to pick with you. He didn't replay it and condemn him. And what they say, right, you've got to bring something, you got to break somebody down and bring them low before you can bring them up again. No, he didn't break him. He just said, you're not broken, Peter. Do you love me? He said, and Peter's broken by now on his own. He said, yes, you know I love you, Jesus. He didn't say, I'm so sorry, Lord, forgive me for denying you. He denied him three times. How many times did Jesus ask him if he loved him? Three times. For every time he denied him, he said, do you love me? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Peter's free. Peter goes on and does a powerhouse after that. A changed man. Look at 17. He said to them a third time, Simon Barjona, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. So how do we deal with all this stuff? How do you deal with all this stuff? How do we get rid of this baggage? Well, Jesus ain't here to condemn you. He's not here to expose your sin to everybody and break you down and make you low. He's here to say, hey, you're not broken. I get it. I'm not offended by what you did, Peter. But how many of us get offended so easy and walk around, I'm offended. I don't like the way you talk to me. Well, Peter talked to him pretty rudely. Jesus didn't get offended. He said, Peter, come on, let's, let's fix this. I know, you, I know you love me. Set up the coals. Set up the whole environment. We're good, Peter. Now I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and make you a new man. I'm going to change you so radically, Peter. You're going to look just like me. You're going to be able to heal people, raise people from the dead. When you pray, Acts chapter 4, the earth will shake. You're going to walk out of prison doors. You're going to heal people by your shadow walking by. You're going to cast devils out of people. Peter, you're going, to cha you're going to change people because of this moment right here. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I'm just going to ask you just straight out. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? <laughs> You're not broken. Stand to your feet, please. Stand to your feet, please. I hope there's people online watching and receiving healing right now. But let's move on, folks. It's a new year. I don't want to do the same old stuff. Come on. When 2000 came, we were all sit hiding in our homes because we thought the, comp the world was going to crash. It's 22 years later. Are we still stuck in 2000 because we think the world's going to crash? The world ain't crashing because of a virus. Come on. Yeah, there is a new normal. The church is rising up to the measure of the stature of Christ. We're not going back to the way we used to be. Forget that old normal. We're forgetting those things. We're pressing on for the prize. My focus is on the finish line. I want to be more like him in 2022. How about you? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father God.